and I'm back talking about meter. Um, so one thing that we do when we're trying to um, describe the metrical pattern in lines of verse, and I'm saying verse here um, rather than poetry because we find lines written in different metrical patterns, um, not only in poetry but in plays as well. An example of this is the, the prevalence of blank verse, which is unrhymed iambic pentameter. And if you don't know what that is now, you'll know what iambic pentameter is really soon. Um, in plays throughout the uh, early modern period or the Renaissance in England. Um, and also we see examples of metrical patterns and other patterns and figures of speech um, in speeches even now with repetition and chiasmus and metaphors and metonymy. Um, not that those are metrical patterns, although repetition is. Um, but scansion, what the heck is scansion? Scansion is what we use to describe the meter of a poem. What is the meter? The meter is um, sort of the pace and rhythm of the words. We have, um, and, 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 and in English poetry, uh, poems that are written in English, a lot of times when people are paying attention to meter, um, they're, they're, they're using what is called, and don't get hung up on this term, accentual syllabic meter, meaning they're looking at what syllables are accented the most, what syllables have the kind of heavy to tum, that's an I am, to tum, to tum, to tum, but soft, what light, through yawn, through window, breaks, see there's five of them, and the accent or the stress is every other syllable, so it goes little, uh, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, five times. Um, and so we're sticking to poetry. Um, so quoting a speech from Shakespeare might be helpful for a second, but ultimately um, we're looking at what are the key, some of the key terms we need when we're going to try to uh, scan a poem. And the first thing that we need to, un the word we need to know is foot. Not what we walk on, not 12 inches, but a metrical foot. A metrical foot is the basic measurement in accentual syllabic meter. And the foot is sort of the, uh, the, the sort of the musical pattern or the, the amount of accents and where they are inside of a measure, uh, a slice of a line of poetry. Um, so an I am, like I was talking about before, is a foot that is two syllables long. It begins with an unstressed syllable and then is followed by a stressed syllable. And they are the most common in English. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of metrical feet um, and all different kinds of meters around the world. And so if this is something that you're super into, I've got really great news for you. You can do a deep dive. This is like a rabbit hole that is pretty much endless. You can just search for all the different metrical patterns forever. But we're just gonna stick with some basics. Um, and I'm gonna use an I am at first as an example of how we talk about those basics, right? So when you're talking about what kind of meter a poem has, you you say what kind of foot it has. So if it's if it's mostly iams, it's iambic, right? And then you use the uh, the, the Latin prefix. You use the prefix for um, how many of those feet are in a line. So um, a poem that has five iambic feet, an iam, remember, is ta-tum. Can you see it? Ta-tum. Hopefully it doesn't turn backwards. Um, so it's how many feet are in a line. And if, say, there are five iambic feet in a line, you have ten syllables total, the poem is written in iambic pentameter, penta meter, if you will, five, right? Like pentagon or pentagram, right? Um, <laughs> there's my cat. Um, 
So an example of a type of poem that is often written in an iambic pentameter is a sonnet. So if we look at the first line of Count Cullen's Collins, Yet Do I Marvel, hopefully this doesn't show up backwards. Um, it looks like this, if you write, if you write the, um, the syllables over time, I mean the, the, if you annotate where the stresses are. I doubt not God, I doubt, I doubt not God is good, well-meaning and kind. Now think about the way to tell whether or not you have the stresses right is if you say it and you put the stresses on the opposite syllable, the wrong syllable, you sound like a robot. And if you overstress the syllable, you sound, it still makes sense. I doubt not God is good, well-meaning, and kind. Well-meaning, kind, right? I doubt not God is good, well-meaning, kind. If you put the stresses on the opposite, where they don't go, you sound like a robot. I doubt not God is good, well-meaning, kind, right? Do you sound like a robot? So, but here you have it all stressed, all, you have all of them marked. Now, if each of these unstressed followed by stressed, unstressed followed by stressed, this is one line even though it's written on two lines, just they don't all fit on the card. Um, if you separate that into the feet, you can see there are five metrical feet. One, two, three, four, five. That is why it is iambic pentameter, pentameter, right? Another example of this would be um, an anapest, right? An anapest is another rising foot. Two unstressed syllables followed by a stressed syllable, so it goes to the tum, right? An example of something that's written in anapestic tetrameter four feet in a line is "'Twas the night before Christmas. "'Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the house "'not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. "'The stockings were hung with the chim by the chimney with care." Right, you hear it? Um, ta -ta -tum, ta -ta -tum, ta -ta -tum, ta -ta tum You hear it? An anapest creates like a rushing feeling in a line. Back to the balcony speech, which is written in blank verse, but soft but light through yonder window breaks. It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. There's an anapest in there. Right as soon as he sees Juliet, is the sun. Ta -ta -ta. It like rushes forward. It's beautiful. And then he follows up in the second line just to make sure. I'm talking about Shakespeare here. Just to make sure we get it, right? It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon. So good. Anyway, so that, <laughs> Twas the Night Before Christmas. Let's get back to the Twas the Night Before Christmas. Twas the Night Before Christmas is anapestic tetrameter. There are four anapestic feet, and that means it's anapestic tet, tetra, like Tetris, tetrameter, right? So if you're looking for more on labeling this kind of stuff, seriously, Google is your friend. I'm not, in, like, it, you, you can really just go forever. You can hit me up because um, this is some of my favorite stuff and I can talk about it for way too long, um, which is why I have everything written here so that I don't just start this. I, I've gotten off the page twice and gone like, what about this? What about that? I'm trying to stick with it. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick explanation of the most common finds of, kinds of meter that we find in poetry that's written in English. We covered the I am already, but an I am, if you remember, is unstressed and then stressed, right? Um, next, we're going to talk about the trochee. It's kind of like an inverted I am, right? Um, it's first a stressed syllable and then an unstressed syllable. So a trochee might be some, well, not might, is something that we find in William Blake's uh, Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright poem, right? So it's tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. Tiger, tiger, burning bright. You hear it? Da, 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 da. It creates like a, a, a kind of firmer, uh, marching almost feeling or a, a stalking feeling like the tiger. Yay, Blake. How smart. Another type of um, foot. Another falling foot, a trochees of falling foot, first it's stressed and then it's unstressed, is a dactyl. A dactyl is 
a stressed syllable followed by two unstressed syllables. The word dinosaur is a dactyl. I love that. It always helps me remember it. Da da da. Da da da. Right? Um, something worth knowing is that um, dactylic hexameter, which is six dactylic feet, is um, the was used in uh, classical epic poems in both Greek and Latin. So, you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey and all of the Homeric stuff and Virgil and uh, they all wrote, they all wrote in dactylic hexameter. Um, the example I have here is from Tennyson. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward. All in the valley of death. Da 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 da. It's from the Charge of the Light Brigade. You can almost hear the horses charging in. The thing that's really interesting about dactylic meter is it does sort of have that like beat of a drum. Like I can I can like um, imagine it in uh, in like some fantasy novel where there's some hordes like battling each other and marching toward each other and they're like da 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 right um and so it creates this uh really honestly epic feeling like poets have been tuned into the music of the language and how it affects our experience of what we encounter for so long so I'm just going to bring up Anapest again because it's another three syllable foot. This is a this is a rising foot like the I am da 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 da. It was the night before Christmas and all through the house you hear it da 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 da. Two unstressed syllables, then a stressed syllable, Anapest. That creates that rushing, rushing feeling, right? It creates that same feeling that Romeo's heart beats when he sees and says the word Juliet. Two more feet that we're going to go over are um, the spondy. See all my examples of spondies? It's because most poems, you couldn't really, I mean, challenge. I'm going to throw it out there. Um, there are a couple of things out there that are written, and I didn't, um, really didn't, I didn't look them up because they're kind of fun, but eh, you find them. Uh, a spondy is a heavy-footed foot, right? And usually a spondy is like a, a, a metrical substitution to create weight in a line, right? So a line that you have that's going, that's either that's either iambic or, or trochaic, in order to keep it from being like, it's like a fill in drums or something, right? Um, or like a like a bass, like a heavy bass, right? It's so that the, the line is going along and then it's got this two boom, boom. The spondy is two accented syllables right on top of each other, which creates like a weight and a heaviness. And it makes you, especially if you're reading out loud, it makes you kind of stop and pay attention to that moment in the poem. Um, and then spondy's sort of inverse shy cousin is the pyrrhic foot. I have always hated spelling the word pyrrhic. But also the wild spelling of this word helps me to remember that it's two unstressed syllables like a little whisper. Ta -ta. Right? Something that we see sometimes, kind of often, um, in in sonnets and in other forms of iambic pentameter is a pyrrhic foot showing up right before a spondy. Right? And when we see that, we call it ba bam a double I am. Um, and what's interesting about a double I am is it does sort of like slow that line down at the end and sort of give you a second to rest with that moment, right? Now, that's those are the only types of metrical feet that I'm going to talk about. Um, some people have a really easy time hearing meter metrical feet kind of land on your ear. Um, other people, they, they, they don't. Um, also, uh, if you're reading it out loud, dialects can, uh, your dialect can influence how you read something. Something might be two syllables long for you and one syllable long for someone else. 
like oil, right? Um, my partner says oil differently than I do. I, like, well, I don't know if he does or not. It doesn't matter. But other people I know say oil differently than I do. They say like, I can't say it that way. And I'm not going to make fun of anybody. Um, orange. That's how I say it. Everybody teases me about it. Um, other people say orange. Orange. <laughs> um, so, but nothing rhymes with orange. But still, it could be in the middle of a line or it could, you know, uh, do its thing somehow or another. Regardless. Again, I want to remind you that being aware of these things isn't the isn't your isn't your end goal right um it's just one more tool in your box to help you see it's one more lens in your lens kit if you will rather than a box like if you're at the eye doctor and it's like better or worse better or worse does this help you see something better does understanding the meter in which the poem is written give you any insight or does it provide you any buttressing for your experience does it help you to experience the poem differently just pay attention to the music of the poem and how it influences how you read does it push your eyes along the text does it make you stop does it does it create a sense of, of immediacy or epicness? Does it create a sense of, of slowness or quiet? How is the author using the music of the poem to shape your experience, to provide you with an experience? And you can write about that when you do your analysis or if you write poetry or even if you write prose to be honest that variety of the pacing in your writing shorter sentences longer sentences um shorter and longer um syllable patterns and stuff like that um all of those things can shape and guide your reader's experience as well. So these are things to consider. They are not your ultimate goal, but they are tools and lenses that you can use while writing and reading poetry to describe your experience or to shape the experience of your reader.